Hey, Steve Tresky here. Welcome back to the show. Uh, quite a few things to touch on this week. If you've been following this channel for the last little while, you know there's really been three key themes that we've been talking about on this show. And we had an update pretty much to all three of those themes this past week. So I kind of want to walk you through those because I think they're incredibly important for the outlook of the Canadian housing market and exactly what is happening. So, you know, key theme number one has been immigration. Uh, you know, a million, 1.2 million people coming into this country over the past 12 months, a huge blind spot from the federal government. Um, you know, yes, they're setting their permanent residency targets at nearly 500,000 people, but the big influx of immigration has actually been on the foreign worker and foreign student side. Of course, the political pressures have been mounting. We've been talking about these uh, for many, many months on the show. Actually, I'd argue several years now. Um, so we've been talking about these themes and there's been enough pushback now. People starting to finally realize that these stories are actually showing up in mainstream media. Of course, once they start showing up in mainstream media, they then actually apply political pressure to the government in power. And so that's exactly what uh, has been happening. So the federal government had this you know, cabinet shuffle. They started switching around people. Uh, in cabinet there. And so they did a housing retreat, a housing retreat this past week in Prince Edward Island. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the themes, uh, again, was immigration, particularly as it pertains to foreign students. And so let's clip in uh, former immigration minister turned housing minister, Sean Fraser's comments right here. Are you willing to put a cap on the number of international students in Canada? I think that's one of the options that we ought to consider, but I think we should start by trying to partner with institutions to understand what role they may play to reduce the pressure on the communities that they're operating within. Uh, but that's a conversation that is premature to arrive at a decision on, and uh, we'll have more to say after I have the chance to engage with Minister Miller. So they're finally, uh, again, there's enough political pressure that's saying, okay, well, now we're going to review, the, the, we're going to review, we're going to review this. We've got to review this. We've got to figure it out. Uh, you know, we're a lot more consultation. It could have been stoking demand. Ooh, Oops, uh, but the, you know the horse has already left the barn, so to speak, uh, and so the damage is done. But let, we're now going to actually review this. We hear you, uh, but let us consult with the universities and the colleges. And of course, you know these are private entities that are, are you know profit-seeking entities, and so they do uh, you know what is ultimately best for their bottom line. Again, private institutions. Uh, they don't have a mandate to supply housing. Uh, you know, they can bring in as many foreign students as they want, not have to worry about where these people are actually going to live. And so, um, if you actually look, there's been some good data that's been posted around recently. Uh, if you look at uh, immigration uh, of foreign students into Canadian colleges, particularly in Ontario, uh, it has grown tremendously over the past four or five years. Uh, now, we don't have the latest data that covers uh, the last two years. So I can only imagine what this chart is going to look like uh, when it comes out, when it gets updated 12 months from now. Uh, and so this is, again, this has been a huge blind spot. Now, again, these colleges are, uh, it, it's ultimately more profitable for them uh, to, to bring in international students. They pay higher tuitions. And there was basically uh, almost like a loophole, I wouldn't say a loophole, but a policy change at the federal government level, take responsibility, uh, but basically allowed these students to then get work permits off of campus. And so essentially, they, they this was almost like a backdoor program that allowed people to come in and actually... Um, get jobs and, and, and created uh, not only immigration into the education system, but allowed them to get work visas and actually work off campus. And so, uh, again, this has created, and that, that ultimately is, is partially a fast track into permanent residency as well. And so this has been, uh, again, a huge blind spot at the federal government level. So again, uh, they're they're now going to look at it. They're going to do some consultations, but this isn't going to change anything in the near term. It just shows that again the political pressure is mounted. This was a huge, huge oversight policy error over the last, uh, particularly over the last three four years. Uh, but that takes us to number two. So you've had this intense pressure, obviously, on housing demand. Uh, there's a great tweet here uh, that was from uh, mortgage broker Rob Campbell on Twitter. 
which really highlights what we've been talking about on this show. You remember my video uh, on YouTube, I think it's 150,000 views on that one. I think it's probably the best performing video on this channel to date, going back nine plus years that we've started this channel, uh, is the Bank of Canada, as I said, the Bank of Canada has locked people into their homes. Okay, this is what happens when you get a uh, mortgage rates triple, okay, yes, they, they're they coming off a low base, but they've tripled, okay, they've tripled in less than 18 months uh, on record high house prices, and you've taken a mortgage stress test where the minimum minimum mortgage stress test used to be 5.25%, you've now pushed it up to about 8, 8.5%, and, and some circumstances, if you're on a variable rate mortgage, your stress test is 9%. People don't qualify to actually move. And so a lot of people, I would argue, as Rob Campbell is saying here, they don't qualify for the homes that they currently live in. And so there's a couple circumstances I want you just to play it through, right? So like you think about a lot of people that are like moving in the housing market, you know, moving. A lot of the times they're moving up the ladder. That's a very common thing, right? Like I've got a one bedroom condo or a two bedroom condo. I need more space. I have a family growing. You know, you've got this one asset, you want to trade it up the ladder. And 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 again, so you're typically going to grow your mortgage as you move up the ladder. But that becomes incredibly difficult to do when you have to get stress tested at eight, eight and a half percent today. Um, and you got to basically stomach a six percent mortgage rate. And for you to port the mortgage, even if you do, even if you wanted um, even if you want to port your existing mortgage to a new property, you have to requalify. You ha that's a very important distinction. You have to requalify. Now, again, if you've got a fixed rate mortgage at, let's say, 2.5%, you're going to get re-stress tested at the minimum qualifying rate of 525 because you're taking a very low mortgage rate and you're porting it. So long as the loan to value stays the same and the property value basically stays the same, uh, or the mortgage amount, I should say, stays the same, and your loan to value stays the same, you, you, you should pass that stress test and you should be able to port your mortgage. Now, if you're on an existing variable rate mortgage and you want to port it, right, you need to get stress tested at basically minimum, you know, eight and a half, nine percent, because that's where those variable rate mortgages are at today based on the stress test. So it's your contractual rate plus two percent. And so this is a lot of people that don't actually even qualify to port their mortgage. And so this is ultimately uh, is creating a lot of these issues, which is like, where's the supply? Um, well, there is no supply because people are stuck and trapped in their houses right now. Um, and so you just have incredibly low sales activity in general. And we're seeing kind of similar dynamics in the U.S. Um, housing inventory is at 20-year lows in the United States. It's at 20-year lows here in Canada. Um, and because, you know, again, the U.S. has different mortgage dynamics, but what they don't have is they don't have a mortgage stress test. And that's actually the biggest killer for people moving right now is yeah the mortgage rates suck at six percent but you know you gotta attack on another two to qualify uh and so that's ultimately what's stymieing uh people's ability to move not only to add inventory to the market um but also demand and new home sales and so in general just not a lot of act housing activity in the market and i suspect that's going to continue and i would argue even going to get worse in the back half of this year. I think housing activity is going to be anemic in the back half of this year, so long as mortgage rates stay here in the sixes. Um, and so I think that's, uh, that's, that's, that's number two. That was number two on our big themes, was people are locked and trapped into their homes. Uh, there was a number that came out from TD this week in their earnings report that showed nearly 23%, nearly 23% of their mortgage loan book outstanding has amortizations greater than 35 years. Okay, remember, you can only get a contractual mortgage on a 30-year amortization at max. So by saying you've got 23% of your book with amortizations greater than 35 years tells me that those are basically borrowers that took out variable rate mortgages and are not current on their principal and interest 
aka they are um, not paying any principal down and their loan balance or their amortizations are extending out and in some cases their balances are actually growing because they're not paying all of the interest outstanding and so this is a real real problem and again it's a problem that you can kind of just kick under the rug so long as you stay in your home don't say anything keep paying your mortgage payments but don't say anything as soon as you say i want to leave i want to port my mortgage you're going to have to figure that out so again people are stuck in their homes big theme number two uh the final and third theme um comes from you know what we've been talking about again on the housing supply side i love looking at data but I love having the anecdotes to overlay on top of the data because sometimes you have to look and say, well, are the anecdotes, are they lining up with the data? And so there's a good tweet here from Jen Keysmat. She was the uh, former uh, Toronto City uh, planner. And so she's very, very deep in the weeds of the uh, Toronto development industry. And she says, you know, in this meeting, uh, she says all these projects are now going on hold and this these are projects that likely have not even shown up yet uh, in 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 how in future housing start that are clearly going to roll over now remember if we're overlaying the data residential building permits are at their lowest levels uh, in over a decade across this country here in Canada and so future housing supply is going to get obliterated two, three, four years out from now. You've already got enough housing sort of in the construction, under construction pipeline. As those projects come to completion, you're sort of sowing the seeds for that future housing supply crunch, which I would argue is probably two and a half, three years down the road. Um, but this kind of overlays to theme number one, which is the federal government, which is taking all of the heat uh, for the housing crisis uh, that is actually getting worse. Because if you look at affordability, uh, it has gotten tremendously worse over the past 18 months uh, as home prices have remained relatively sticky and mortgage rates have ballooned through the roof. Housing affordability has gotten worse. Rents have gone up. Mortgage payments have ballooned. It's gotten worse. And so they're saying, well, we need to bring in it. We, we don't really want to touch immigration. We still really, really need it. Maybe we can do some exercises about thinking and, and pontificating about reducing the Im, uh, foreign students. Um, but we need immigrants to sort of build housing for the immigrants that are coming. Um, but yet you're facing this economic cycle, which is rolling over. And as it rolls over and as the cost of capital becomes incredibly expensive, you can't defy gravity and housing starts and building permits will continue to roll over. And so just seeing more and more of these anecdotes in Toronto uh, just really confirms these three large views that I have. Um, and keep in mind, that's all economic activity. Very, very, very important economic activity in a, in a country that has become so reliant on housing, rightfully or wrongfully, uh, that I think is going to slow the economy and GDP tremendously over the coming six to 12 months. And like I said, I think over the back half of this year, it is going to be tough uh, for the housing industry. So uh, that's all I got for this week. Keep in mind the three big themes, we're seeing them all come into play. See you next week.